Vijay Boyapati, it's a pleasure to have you here on the Laissez Faire vodcast, which I'm calling it now. Now, where 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 are you right now? I'm in Copenhagen, Denmark. Okay. And what draws you to Copenhagen, Denmark? Uh, a visit uh, to my girlfriend who was working here for a week. Okay. I thought you were also attending a conference on... Uh, no, that's Peter Serta who's in Vienna. That's right. Bitcoin conference. Okay, okay. That's right. Yeah. Nonetheless, you were a kind of an early enthusiast for Bitcoin, which is why... Uh, and, and also, you have a very technical background, right? You were a, a, a programmer at Google for a time, right? Yeah. I was an engineer at Google uh, from 2002 to 2007. Yep. And uh, so you followed Bitcoin from its inception, is that right? Uh, I wish I had. I wish I had been as early, a, uh, early an adopter as you make me out to be. I, I guess I, I knew about Bitcoin fairly early on, and I had some friends who were enthusiastic about it. Um, I was interested in it from a theoretical point of view, but I, I, I wish I had bought more Bitcoins uh, early on. Yeah, well, I guess everybody's feeling that way right now because it's at forty dollars. It began the year at fifteen, right? That's right. Yep. Now I notice in your writings you're kind of careful in your use of language. You don't think Bitcoin is money yet? No, I don't. Um, I I think a, a good criteria for whether something is money or not is whether or not it's used in calculation uh, and whether entrepreneurs are using it in calculation. And I think a good measure of that is when you see people purchasing everyday goods uh, with a currency. So, for instance, a lot of Austrians will, will claim that gold is money. I don't think gold is money. Um, because you can't go to your local baker and buy a loaf of bread with ounces of gold. I think gold has been demonetized. Um, but Bitcoin has some of the properties that you would expect in money. People hold it in reserve uh, as savings and you can use it as a medium of exchange. But I don't think it has attained that final stage of monetization. You know... I can recall feeling very sure of what you're saying concerning gold for many years, that it, it's not money, it's just gold. And a lot of it really comes down to the use of language, but I remember it was Guido Holzman who first introduced the prospect to me that something other than the dollar or existing fiat paper currencies could become money, even under the current conditions. You know, that he thought gold could be somehow... Uh, become money, and maybe that would have happened in in the uh, digital with with the internet, but the government hasn't allowed it, right? That's correct. I think one of the things which hinders gold being money is that the state makes it illegal to perform transactions in gold. If it were the case that the state said uh, it's perfectly legal for transactions to happen in gold. I think a lot of merchants would accept gold in payment and you would have holders of gold looking to uh, purchase goods with the gold which is appreciated over time. Uh, and I think that's the case with Bitcoin right now. You have people who hold Bitcoin, uh, who purchase their Bitcoin at say 50 cents per, uh, per Bitcoin. And now it's forty dollars per Bitcoin, so they're sitting on a huge gain, nominal gain, and they presumably would like to spend that gain on something. You you may have had someone who uh, invested, let's say, a thousand dollars in Bitcoin, and now it's worth eighty thousand dollars, and <clears throat> that person is looking for an outlet to spend that gain. Uh, so what you have is a, a strong incentive for merchants to sell in Bitcoin terms to uh, capture the demand from those people who are sitting on gains from uh, Bitcoin. 
uh, that they, they bought earlier on. And I think the same thing would happen with gold as well, except that uh, the state won't let that happen. It makes it illegal to transact in gold. Yeah, I've, I've wondered if, if for some time if Bitcoin was a kind of uh, safety valve, sort of uh, medium of exchange in the sense that it probably wouldn't exist at all if gold and silver were, were legal to be monetized. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. So in, in a free market, would Bitcoin have come about? Uh, I think there would certainly be less incentive for Bitcoin to come about because uh, gold would largely serve the purpose that Bitcoin is serving now for uh, transactions, for savings. Um, and you could imagine that people would build uh, a, a digital system on top of gold so that you could pay people at long distances rather than having to carry the gold and directly give it to a merchant. But there are benefits of Bitcoin over gold and it may even have been possible that Bitcoin would have uh, found a niche in a world, a truly free market world where gold was money. Um, uh, I suppose one of the, the advantages is that you have very low uh, transaction costs, almost zero transaction costs with Bitcoin. So if I if I wanted to send you a Bitcoin, it costs me almost nothing to do so. There's no storage cost. Um, uh, there's really no risk that I'm, I'm going to have Bitcoin physically stolen from me. Uh, there is a risk, of course, that I could forget my uh, password. Um, that's so so there, there are advantages to Bitcoin over gold that you could conceive of that might have made it successful even in a free market. But yeah. that's an that's a abstract question. It's unclear what would have happened. Uh, VJ, most people when the subject comes up, their eyes glaze over in confusion because they can't follow it. It's, it's a little bit like uh, Bitcoin for a lot of people is what it's like for Americans to travel to... to, to uh, the Far East or something. They land in a world that they don't understand, you know, and they stay in the hotel and they don't know how to use the lights or the toilet or, you know. <laughs> you know, you know, it's like an unfamiliar place. And I'm wondering if maybe your technical background makes you feel more at home in the Bitcoin world. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think having a bit of a technical background helps as an early adopter when the systems and tools are not really in place or easy to use. I, I remember I had a bet with a friend uh, about a year ago about Federal Reserve policy and I won the bet and he gave me the choice of taking payment in uh, silver coins or in Bitcoin. And just on a lark I decided to take payment in Bitcoin and he uh, tried to send me the Bitcoins and at the time it was much more difficult to receive bitcoins in payment. You had to go through this arcane procedure. You had to download the entire blockchain. Yeah. Um, it, it was not easy at all. And unfortunately, uh, I lost the laptop in which those bitcoins were held. So <laughs> those bitcoins have disappeared from the world, uh, essentially. How many uh, were there? How many were there? I think it was five, so yeah. what's that, two, $200 worth of Bitcoin? Yeah, that's about, uh, what, 30 minutes of, or an hour worth of mining, current current money, mining, right? Uh, I, that's a good question. I'm not sure what the rate uh, at which Bitcoins are being produced by mining, but that, that, that could well be the case. <laughs> You know, I I I, lo I I love this world because it's funny to me to talk about mining bitcoins. First time I heard it, I uh, I was puzzled, and then I met a, I met a, a real life bitcoin miner, actually. <laughs> and, uh, well, so it was a profitable enterprise early on, and you know the the uh, similarities, the analogy to gold mining uh, are quite strong in the sense that. In the early days of gold mining, if you if you struck gold, it was really quite easy to uh, find the gold. You could pan for gold in a river, and it would just be sitting there on the surface. And over time, it's become increasingly difficult to mine gold. Now you have these huge strip mines where you have to dig a mile underground, and it's uh, environmentally very uh, 
uh, degrading. Um, now, with Bitcoin, after people have devoted a lot of processing to it, it's actually much harder to obtain Bitcoin Bitcoins through mining. Um, if you were one of the early people who were interested in Bitcoin and you, you threw a few computers at it, you could have made what today would be, I don't know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of Bitcoin. Yeah, this fellow I met, who incidentally was not wearing a hat with a light on the front, but uh, he was uh, just a computer program. He he made a, a server that does nothing but mine bitcoins, and the server itself is earning the minimum wage. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all very uh, it's all very puzzling. I have to tell you. Um, you know, back to the psychological point. I think a lot of people fear Bitcoin because they don't, they don't, they don't understand it. And uh, there's a sense of that it's ephemeral. You know, that it's a, a kind of a gauzy thing out there that uh, maybe you can never really be able to develop confidence in it. But my experience so far is the more you use it, the more confident you grow in it. Yeah. Yep. And I think you made a great point about um, actual use of it makes you much more familiar with it and um, does a lot more than uh, speculating about the theory of it for understanding what it is, what it can do and, and what's potentially possible with it. Um, so I, I hope uh, that people try it out and, and see what, what's possible, especially libertarians. I think the potential the currency has um, to further our aims as libertarians is just unbounded. Um, so I, I would like to see more libertarians at least investigate its use. I worry sometimes, um, I, I certainly agree with you, but I, I, I worry that sometimes that I'm getting interested in topics that are only relevant to a small sector of society, you know, a, uh, a little subculture that's obsessed with with a non-aggression axiom or something like that, and like it doesn't doesn't matter to anybody in the street. And I and I try to check myself in my own writing. Am I saying something that matters to that guy over there? You know. Mm -hmm. So this morning, I I because I've been obsessing about bitcoins. In fact, <clears throat> I spent uh, some time this morning transferring my my blockchain wallet to my new iPhone. Oh, and cool. that was fun because the app didn't transfer over, and I was able to use my identifier and. And 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 transfer my Bitcoin, so I was really happy about that. So anyway, obsessed with this, and 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 shopping at the Bitcoin store now, which has only been open two weeks. I, yeah. I just I did a quick search of the Wall Street Journal for Bitcoins, and I found exactly two stories. So you are in fact an early adopter. Yeah. Right? Well, so this is what I'm asking. This is what, I guess what I'm wondering if this is such a big deal, so important. Why isn't the mainstream financial press covering it? I think because it's really in its very early days. I mean, to, to put this in context, I think uh, it was released. I mean, the, the protocol, the paper describing the protocol was released in 2009, early 2009. Um, so t to me, it, it's been a phenomenal success already that it has monetized as far as it already has is, uh, I think, a testament to the elegance of uh, the solution to the engineering involved. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a, the early stages and people who are using it are people who get particular value from it where they can't get that value elsewhere. So anonymous transactions for purchasing drugs is one example or online gambling. But I think from those... Um, sort of gray markets, it's spreading into other areas because it does have definite benefits over um, modern uh, financial uh, means of transacting such as credit cards. The, the lower transaction fees uh, are a huge benefit and, and the lack of chargebacks is another one. So if you speak to any merchant um, or anyone dealing in a payment space, one of the big disadvantages of dealing with credit cards is chargebacks. That is, uh, someone purchases something from you and then some later time they 
renege on it or they say they didn't actually want to purchase it. This causes quite a large uh, cost to the credit card companies and is part of the reason why the, the fees that credit card companies charge merchants are quite high. They're around 3%. Whereas if you're accepting Bitcoin, there, there are no fees. It's 0%. Of course, you have to deal with the volatility of the price of Bitcoin, but the the transactions are essentially frictionless, which is a huge advantage if you're a merchant. How would you distinguish its function as a as a payment system, which is very obvious to me? I mean, uh, you know, I can stand there with somebody and transfer Bitcoins back and forth all day. It's it's just a lot of fun. It doesn't <laughs> matter if they're right next to me or on the other side of the world. You can just so easily then. I gave some bitcoins to somebody the other, other day by scanning his his uh, QR code, you know, off my own screen, and they landed in. The, so that's obvious. But how do you distinguish the payment system features from like pure monetary features? It seems like they're kind of getting mixed up here, like kind of blurry in some way. Um, uh, hmm, that's interesting. I'm not sure how. Uh, to answer that question, except to repeat kind of what you said, which was that you have amazing advantages in the ability to, if you wanted to, uh, let's say, for instance, I was someone important, which I am not, and you were, you, I, I was charging you to interview me. I'm sitting here in Denmark, and you can send over the bitcoins, and I can receive them very, very easily in a matter of seconds or maybe a minute. Um, and and so you can send uh, capital across the world very very easily. Mm-hmm. So, but is it? I guess what I mean is it possible for something to become a great payment system, but still not actually become a money? Uh, sure. I I guess so. I mean, Bitcoin does not have to become money to be successful. I would say that it's already successful. If you define success, uh, as, as I do, um, as allowing people to do things that they would not otherwise be able to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think it has already achieved a measure of success. Uh, to become money would be a staggering success. It would be an overwhelming success that we could not imagine. I, I imagine that if Bitcoin became some kind of uh, widely accepted online monetary standard, the dollar price of Bitcoin could be a hundred, maybe a thousand times higher than where it is now. So I think you have to separate these things of whether it's money and um, whether it's a success. I, I would say that Bitcoin is money when you can walk down to your baker and, and say, um, I would like to buy a loaf of bread. And he says, that's Point zero one bitcoins. Right, but that, I mean, already I've had that experience. I was two weeks ago in New Hampshire, and I I bought stuff with my bitcoins and sold some of my stuff for bitcoins. Yeah, well, I, I think we're along the way. I we we are much further along than I had anticipated a uh, year ago. I I thought bitcoin was only being used for. Uh, black market or grey market activities and I was a little bit shocked to find that there are a lot of goods which are um, uh, payable in Bitcoin terms <clears throat> and I think that's a function of the fact that the price is also r- rising. These two things are t- tied together. Um, if you imagine that you had a large gain in Bitcoin, you want to buy stuff in Bitcoin uh, presumably and so merchants are out there thinking, well, there are a lot of people out there with a lot of gains in Bitcoin, and they want to spend those gains, so let's offer our service in Bitcoin. So you've seen websites like WordPress, uh, Reddit, um, accepting Bitcoin, and a lot of small merchants as well. And now these, these, most of these small merchants are, are doing it through a service called BitPay, which uh, actually pays them in dollars. So does that yes. actually count? does that count as receiving Bitcoins? Uh, sure. It's, uh, I, I mean, to the purchaser, it, it does. They certainly can use their Bitcoins. And the seller, 
at this moment in time may not have as much confidence to keep their savings in Bitcoin terms. So they want an instant okay. uh, tr uh, transaction to dollars so that they are essentially transacting in dollars. But you could imagine at some point in the future, sellers would have gained confidence in Bitcoin and would think, maybe I should keep my savings sure. in Bitcoin terms for the advantages that that gives me. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. So you want to convert it. It's in the same sense that early on in, uh, in PayPal's history, people used to download their balances really quickly and like get them out of PayPal as soon as possible, and now they're happy to leave them there. You know, yeah, that's right. They, yeah, they're it, growing confidence that PayPal is not going to like vanish or something. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly it. Now, yeah. what about the claim that hyperinflation could actually affect Bitcoin? Oh, you mean hyperinflation of the dollar? Of of uh, of that that so many will be created that uh, the thing will become worthless. Oh, oh, oh. So, so Bitcoin has been designed so that the total supply of Bitcoin will never uh, uh, increase above 20, mu uh, 20 million or 21 million. I can't remember the exact number. About 21 million Bitcoins. So uh, what will happen is as people are mining, it becomes more difficult to mine over time. And the total supply of Bitcoin will asymptotically approach 21 million bitcoins, and I think it will approach that. It's engineered to approach that number around 2,140, so a little over 100 years from now. Oh, I didn't realize it was that. That was the estimate. So that's irrelevant for for the uh, for the lifetimes of any existing person. Yeah. Yeah. I hadn't, I hadn't realized that. I thought that maybe if uh, the Bitcoin miners really got busy that we would uh, see this arrive in five or ten years. So. No, no. It's actually the, the schedule at which Bitcoins are mined, it follows a very uh, almost precise schedule. I mean, it can change a little bit. The number of Bitcoins being produced is well known in advance. Yes. Well, and that's the other thing that's interesting to me about it. Unlike Federal Reserve policy, where you never know what the hell they're going to do next, right? We don't even know how many dollars there are, or even what a dollar is, really. And people argue about this interminably. No two people in the world agree on what the money supply is. The Bitcoin world is entirely open, right? So you can see every transaction. Yep, the protocol is open and the blockchain is open. That is the record of all the transactions that have ha happened thus far. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested, you can um, inspect the protocol. The paper was was uh, published by Satoshi Nakamoto, the nom de guerre of the inventor of uh, Bitcoin. So it's completely open and it's very predictable. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's great in that sense, there's a lot more transparency. And so far, when I, I was looking at some of the live Bitcoin transactions, it seems like, I watched it for 10 minutes, it seems like there's a, a new transaction about every one or two seconds. Yeah, that's, that's right. And, and so that, that, that's an interesting point because to give you a sense of the scale of Bitcoin versus uh, Visa, the, the credit card um, uh, company, I think they deal with a peak number of transactions in the order of 5,000 transactions per second. Okay. So Bitcoin, as you mentioned, is there's about a transaction a second. So essentially the, the big credit card um, provider is dealing with 5,000 times more transactions per second. So that gives you a sense for the scale that Bitcoin could grow into if it becomes a successful online medium of exchange. Well, and still, actually, given how long the dollar's been around and Visa's been around, uh, that's quite a lot of activity for a currency that was just uh, just created, more or less, uh, two years ago. Or yeah. three years ago, right? Absolutely, yeah. Now, uh, what about the prospects that we're in a bubble? Is, a, is, a, is a bubbles are bubbles possible in a Bitcoin, or is that not possible? I don't think the term bubble is the correct one to use for something um, which is being monetized, uh, because when something is become becoming money, it is inherently overvalued. 
uh, in the sense that its value starts rising above its use value. So if you imagine in the process of gold becoming money, initially, and I'm giving you know the, the, the Austrian story of the regression theorem, uh, initially gold has use value in jewelry or, or whatever it was used for. As it's not particularly valuable. And then someone realizes that they can use it as an indirect uh, medium of exchange to facilitate transactions. And so they hold gold not because it's jewelry, but because it's useful for other transactions. And then the price of gold against all other goods starts rising. It rises above its use value. And, and in a sense, you could say that gold is a bubble. Uh, because now its value is higher than what you can uh, justify by using it or selling it directly to someone to use. Uh, and this is true for anything which is in the process of monetization. Uh, and I think that's true of Bitcoin as well. Uh, Bitcoin's price reflects the market's perception, I believe, that it's uh, going to be monetized. Or in another way, it, it reflects the stage of monetization that Bitcoin is at. And if for some reason the market perceives that Bitcoin will not be money or something will hinder it becoming money, the price could drop significantly. Uh, and this happened about a year ago when the price dropped from $30 back down to about a few dollars, three, four, five dollars. And I think that may have been related to um, a few US senators coming out and saying, Bitcoin must be stopped. It must be made illegal. Um, people are using it to purchase drugs online, and this is intolerable. Um, so the market perceived that perhaps no Bitcoin won't become a successful medium of exchange. Um, so I, I, I don't feel like the word bubble is um, the correct one to use uh, with money. Um, because money is inherently overvalued just because of the fact that it's being used for exchange and not for direct use, I suppose. Well, that begs the question, or it raises the question, what is the use value of a Bitcoin? Ah, well, that's, that's a good question. With, with gold, um, you can say the use value is jewelry, with Bitcoin, you have to look back to the first transaction and ask the question, why would anyone accept Bitcoin? It's a made-up currency. Um, it could be for any number of reasons. It could have been the coolest factor of it. Um, it I, I think the first transaction that I heard of was a, a, a pizza store um, accepted 10,000 Bitcoins for a pizza. Um, and the pizza store owner may have been thinking, well, you know, the cost of this pizza isn't that much, but these, who knows, these Bitcoins could be successful and it might be a tiny, tiny chance that they're successful. So that one transaction established the first uh, exchange and the first exchange value for Bitcoin. And from there, it, it bootstraps itself. Um, now you could buy a whole franchise for those. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure if he still has those bitcoins, that pizza store owner is very, very happy with that yeah. decision. Uh, <laughs> uh, and let me just make a too a comment about the association of Bitcoin with uh, dangerous, you know, drug dealers and you know other sort of shady types. Uh, <laughs> hasn't hasn't the history of innovation in the digital world really essentially since 1995? always begun in the sort of um, socially unacceptable sectors of life? Um, I, I, I guess one could characterize it that way. I, I suppose change um, always causes consternation amongst those who, are, who want the status quo. And uh, so I suppose um, the internet and technology is... Um, they're essentially revolutionary. They're changing society very quickly, and so that is inevitably going to cause a lot of people to become upset. Um, and of course, there are very strong entrenched interests which uh, do not like change and and do not like 
people to be able to do certain things which have, they have deemed uh, um, immoral or illegal. Um, so Bitcoin uh, is sort of a Pandora's box in that sense because it makes a lot of things which are illegal possible. Um, and so it's, a, it's an exciting new world of uh, possibilities for those people who weren't able to do those things. Uh, BJ, before we finish here, and I'd like to continue our discussions at some point because this is very interesting. We should try to track this. But you have a paper out on money and banking that appeared in Libertarian Papers. And can you get to that just by going to Libertarian Papers and looking up your name? Yeah, that's right. You could probably Google VJ deflation <laughs> yeah. and uh, you'll, you'll find the paper, yeah. And do you have an otherwise a website that you maintain uh, for yourself? No, I, I do not. I, I unfortunately not yet important enough. <laughs> <laughs> you don't seem like, you're not working at it too hard. I'm really glad that I was able to get in contact with you and thank you for putting me on your secret Bitcoin list too. Which we won't, we won't tell anybody about. <laughs> Thank you so well, much. Well, it was uh, great to finally uh, see you in person, Jeff. I think I this think is our first time. This is our first time. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a testament to how amazing a world we live in that true. I can see you and you can see me and we're on opposite sides of the world. And uh, this is all brought to us by the market. It's, it's the dream of my childhood, and I have this irrational fear I'm just going to wake up one day and it was all just a lie. <laughs> so, but so far, it seems to be working. I have to pinch myself. But anyway, thank you, VJ, and let's stay in touch. All right, thanks, Jeff. Bye-bye.